Wow. That was amazing. That was like um, the story behind the story. So Lauren stood up and she said, you know, she was dedicated here, right? Did you, did you hear that? Yeah. Her grandfather was one of my best friends. So Jimmy Shipman was here forever. Jimmy was an amazing guy. He died of cancer. It's got to have been 15 years ago, at least, maybe 20. And his whole family was here. Eva was here. Um, when Jimmy passed, he had leukemia for like six years. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He had leukemia for like six years, and you would have never known it. He never, the guy never complained one day. He was sick, sick, sick with, with cancer, never complained. Called me a couple times when he rushed into the hospital, and I'll never forget when Eva called me the last day and said, Pastor, can you come to San Antonio? And I rushed over to San Antonio, and Jimmy looked up and he goes, I'm so sorry to bother you, Pastor. And he said, would you pray for me? I took his hand, put my arm around his neck, prayed for him, and he died in my arms. He went to be with Jesus right at that moment. And we were praying over him. And Zachy, the little guy who just walked up here, are you over there, Zachy? Where'd you go? He works in media. His father was there with me too. He was really close to Jimmy as well. And, and so when you see Lauren get baptized today, and you realize, friends, that's what we talk about here all the time, about destiny, about what God wants to do in your journey, in your family, around you, with people. You have no idea of the influence you have with people if you will just be steady, steadfast, immovable, and always abound in the Lord. God will do the miraculous through you. You'll be shocked what God will do with you. That has nothing to do with the message today and took five minutes of my time, so no, I'm just joking. Now, a couple things really quick. We've got a Discovering Water of Life coming up on the 28th of April, and uh, that's in two weeks. If you'd like to join us, we'd love to get to know you. This is a place where you get started with us and figure out who we are. Um, we'll be in there talking about our history and the journey, and you get to meet our staff, get to meet a bunch of our leaders, and um, just to figure out if this is where you're supposed to be. And, and so this is a great opportunity. You can sign up out on the Welcome Center. You can sign up online, but do sign up, because if you come and show up and don't sign up, we will be eating lunch without you. Okay, so um, let's see. Then we've also got a project going on in Uganda right now, calling it Project Playground. We're installing three playgrounds at three different ministries we run in Uganda. Because of your generosity, I mean, you've given over $20,000 to help make this happen. So um, we, we are looking for four people still to help go in August to Uganda and help us install playgrounds. So if you're interested in that, you can call the church office and talk to Becky. She's in charge of the playground situation. And then finally, and we're gonna talk about this at length today, um, our CityLink campus is gonna open up in August, September, and we are going to have a big kickoff um, on Labor Day week. So the Labor Day, it'll start on Labor Day and run into the next weekend, and we're going to do a whole bunch of wild outreach stuff out down there and invite our whole church down there. And so if you don't know about that, we'll talk about that a little bit more today, but we're forming a team to help kick off. So we're looking for people experienced in planning, leading, organizing um, large events. This is gonna be a large event. And so some of you were with us when we used to do wow jams, and this is gonna be like a big wow jam. So if you'd like to do that, connect with one of our CityLink pastors out on the concourse, they're out by the sign that says CityLink, or you can sign up with a QR code over there with the banner. So there's a bunch of stuff going on, but we're looking for people to step up and help. So Father, we wanna come right now and say thank you, God, for the vision that you gave us 35 years ago, that you had an idea for a church that was just your idea. It certainly wasn't my idea or anybody else's idea. It was your idea. And we wanna thank you for your idea today as we watch those people go in and get baptized. It's an amazing thing to watch people commit themselves to Jesus at a deep level. And we pray that you would ha have that, let that happen in us today, Father, that it wouldn't be about passing information back and forth, but it would be about transformation, that you would change us from the inside out. And everybody said, okay, so you got a Bible and iPad, but we're gonna be in a couple places, but Ephesians chapter four is where you wanna turn. And let me tell you some stories. We're gonna kick off uh, series here today 
It's gonna go for the next six weeks, and I'm gonna start with some history today, but we're gonna talk about our core values. Now, let me explain core values to you. Churches, like people, have callings. Now, a lot of people don't get that. They think, oh, no, you just put a building up and people show up. No, 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 no. No, if God really forms up a church, then there's usually a calling that's very specific to that group of people. There ought to be. And certainly for this church, because it was God's idea to make this happen, it was his calling. Some of us would call it an anointing or a gifting or a purpose, but it is all of those things. And so when Water of Life started 35 years ago, he started us with a purpose in mind. Now, I say it was God's idea because it certainly wasn't my idea. Doing this was like the last thing uh, on my mind. Okay, the first thing on my mind was getting back to Malaysia. I wanted to go back to Fettus Park Baptist Church that offered me a job in Penang, Malaysia, and I thought that's where I was gonna go, and I was gonna be there, and I'd along my whole life to, to live overseas and do outreach and care for people, and so I came back here, and I thought we were gonna go back there, and I'm still here. So, so. It definitely wasn't my idea. No, it wasn't, wasn't my idea to stay here. So I was like, one guy said to me, you know, you're, you're the only guy I've ever known that your church actually grew when you told people that if they got on the plane with you, you, were, you had a parachute on, you were gonna jump as soon as you could. And people kept coming. <laughs> and I said, that took me about five or six years to figure that out. But I, you know, it, it, it took me some time because, you know, one evening in 1989, we were doing a men's Bible study. We play basketball and we do men's Bible study. And my life changed one night when, and Pastor Rolo, it was, it was just Rolo Santos in those days, he wasn't a pastor, but he walked out to my truck and he brought this cocoa can with him. I keep this cocoa can in my office. On the top of it, it says, as the Lord leads for Dan and Gail Vine Community Church. And um, yes, it's a carnation hot cocoa mix. And it, it still has money in it, change. We didn't just live on the change. There's actually dollar bills in there still, but um, this is still real money left from 35 years ago when people supported us. And he actually walked out and said to me, you know, there's $1,600 in here that people gave tonight because they want you to be their pastor. <laughs> and, and, and I said, that is never gonna happen. Now, I don't know how many of you know Jesus like this, but if you tell Jesus it's never gonna happen, you probably just signed up. You know, and that's exactly what happened to me. I said, it's never gonna happen, and I, what? Signed up, you know, I, 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 I didn't wanna sign up, but I signed up. So when that starts to take place, you start to think to yourself, God, what are you doing? Why do you want me to stay here? And so I started praying and really pressing to the Lord and saying, what do you wanna do? And it was, you need to obey, so I obeyed. So I started looking for a place to start a church. Well, there was a place over on Haven Avenue. We were in Ranch Cucamonga in those days. Haven and Baseline, there was La Petite Child Care Center. Some of you still remember that place, it was there forever. It's a little Montessori school or something now, but it was, it was La Petite Child Care Center. Now, the amazing thing about La Petite was there had been like five churches in there and they had all folded up. So all of them had failed. Like people were planning churches all over Ranch Cucamonga in those days and most of them were coming out of CBC and Bob Logan because he was a church planter and he was working at Fuller Seminary in the church growth area that time and helping people plant churches. So people were going into that building all the time using it and the churches would fail. So I went in and talked to the lady. I said, you know, there's nobody in here right now and, and we're you know, gonna try to plant a church and so I'm looking for a building and she said, I don't think you wanna come here because everybody that comes here fails. I go, perfect. That'll be perfect, you know, because I obey, we go here, we fail, I get to leave. This is perfect, okay? So we signed on. Now, it was a horrible event. You just gotta understand that. The truth is nobody ever fell asleep at La Petite. Unlike in here, when some of you are snoring when I'm preaching. But no, 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 because there was so much ammonia from the kids peeing on the floor in there all week long, you couldn't go to sleep. It was bad, no, it was bad. You walked in the door and went, whew, is there air in here anywhere? No, you couldn't go to sleep in there. There's too much ammonia in the air. You know, but the, the, the reality was we went there and we did everything wrong that you could do and we kept growing. I mean, we had no worship, friends. We had no worship. You look at the worship here, uh, uh, up here today and you're like, this is amazing. No, we had, we had cassette tapes. Remember, anybody here remember cassette tapes? Like, Four tracks, eight tracks, cassette tapes. Okay, okay. So we had cassette tapes and we sang the cassette tapes. That was it for us. It was like, 
whew, it was hard. But God just kept downloading vision to me. He kept giving me purpose, and I was like, okay, I don't even understand this. I don't want to stay here. But God kept speaking to me. And part of it was born out of convictions in my own heart, and part of it was just downloaded from the heart of God into my heart. So it started with this verse, and I want to read it together with you, and then we'll jump into this together. But it comes out of Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. If you're at Upland or Townsville, one of our other campuses, we want to welcome you. Way to go, Upland. You had a bunch of baptisms today. Yay, Upland, for your baptisms that you had over there. But let's read this loud and together. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the downtrodden will be freed from their oppressors, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. Clearly, this was a prophetic word for Jesus, but also the Lord said to me, this is some of what you're gonna do. And I go, I don't think so. I mean, I never took that class. Like, how do you set people free, help people get healed? I, l- listen, we didn't have those classes in seminary. When we did. I, I had soteriology, pneumatology, eschatology. I had all the ologies, but I didn't have any healing ology. I didn't have any binding up the broken ology. I didn't have none of that. I had no idea what God was trying to do. I only knew this. He was trying to do something in me and then through me, but I was trying to figure that out in, in, in the journey. So how do you start a church? I, I had no idea. I never took that class in seminary either. I, I mean, I'm sitting here going, what, what do I, but Bob Logan, bless his heart, he's up at CBC, and like I said, he was a church growth guy at Fuller Seminary, so he did something. He put together what was called a church planting toolbox. It was just a box with a bunch of information on how to plant a church. I bought one. It was the dumbest thing in the world, but I bought one, you know, I bought one. And, 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 and in the box, you open it up and he had all these ideas about how to plant a church. You know what one of the ideas do? You're supposed to walk the neighborhood around your church and knock on the doors and ask people what it would be like, to what, what kind of church would they like if you were gonna plant a church? Do you know what that, I actually did that. No, I really did. I probably knocked on your door and you didn't even know it. It was the weirdest thing in the world. You knock on people's door and you're like, listen, I'm gonna plant a church and people go, oh no, please don't do that. We have so many churches here, we don't need any more churches. So I walk around Victoria Groves over by the elementary school, knock on people's door. One day I knocked on this lady's door and, I, and we did this for like a couple weeks, Rolo and I did, and, and, and knocked on people's doors and this, la- and this lady answered the door. I knew her. So her daughter had actually dated my son and her, her brother-in-law was a close friend of mine in college and so I knew her and she looks at me and goes, this is a really bad idea, don't do this. And I said, I have, could you do something for me? And she said, well, I said, pray and tell God that because I think you're right. I think it's a really bad idea and, and the funny thing about that is she ended up going to church here for about seven years before she moved away. Yeah. It was, it was God's idea, clearly. It was not my idea. But we ended up with, with, with knocking on door. And, and through all this time, I just ended up having the Holy Spirit speak to me. And he gave me five things that became very important to our church's life. We call them our core values today. It was these things. It was five things. Healing, sending, equipping, caring, and relationships. Now, those things, when you say, what is a core value? It's like we, we tell people here, you need to stay on your number. Be where God wants you to be. Now, our church has a calling and a purpose and a destiny, just like your life does. And as we gather together, we do that together. We do life together. But our core values is what keeps us on track. Our core values keep us on the road, on our number where we're supposed to be. So people come in and they go, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. You should be doing, no, thank you. We're going to do what God told us to do, which are our five core values. And we've stayed there and stayed there and stayed there and stayed there. And God has blessed us because of that. So let me walk through those briefly with you today. I want to give you a little history about them. In the next five weeks, we're going to walk through a value each week, and you're going to get the background and understand why did God do this and what does it mean for you and for us together as we journey out the whole thing called water of life today. So let's talk about this, the Word of God. Let's just start there. The Word of God is really important to me because God uses Word to change my life. When I first came to Jesus, I used to just sit on a bed and read the Good News for Modern Man Bible. Now, uh, I, it was a weird little Bible. There was no these or thous in it. It was like newspaper print, and it had little sketches of skinny people in it, so like stick people. So I could relate to it, you know? I, I understood, it was like, <laughs> there I am in the book, you know? And, 
And, and, and, and what happened was, what happened when I, when I read the Bible, the Holy Spirit would show up in my bedroom, and I had no idea what was happening. I would talk out loud. I'd say, I don't know who you are, what you're doing here, but I know every time I open this book up, you show up. But it was a really wild time in my life. There was a point during that interaction reading the Bible that I slipped off my bed and I said, I don't know if you're real. People tell me that you're alive. All of that, I, I don't get any of this, but I'm desperate. Would you please touch my life? That was the beginning of the end of my old life and the beginning of a new life for me that changed that day, that night, in my bedroom, <laughs> reading the Bible. So friends, because the Bible was so important to me, I, I started to figure this out. The Spirit of God showed up and he made the Bible living to me. I talk to people often today and they're like, I don't get this, I don't get this. I try to read it and it doesn't happen. Listen, you invite the Spirit of God to come. If you just read the Bible without the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible speaking it to you, it becomes very difficult and very hard to read. And so it, you actually become a legalist if you do that too much. It just becomes very legalistic for you. It's what a Pharisee would be. And, and if you're, on the other hand, if you just love the ministry of the Spirit, and you just chase around God all the time, just touch me again, touch me again, Lord. You, you, you don't have any boundaries with the, with the word of God, then you end up being a fanatic if you just chase the spirit without the word. But friends, if you understand the word of God and the spirit of God and put them together, you become a very powerful disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. It's very powerful, very difficult for the enemy to sidetrack you when you have both the word and the spirit together. So those things became very real to me. The fullness of God and a passion to equip people became very real to me. So out of that became the equipping thing that we do. Then there was healing ministries. We have them all over the place. They're in our Grow catalog. There's all kinds of recovery classes here. There's ministry for prayer, for healing. There's all kinds. Why? Because I figured out something a long time ago. I was broken and God needed to put me back together. And, and so were most of you. Now we'll talk about that in a minute. But out of that came our healing ministry. Then we had a caring ministry. We have sending ministry. Sending is like going overseas. Caring is taking care of the poor. And the caring ministry was actually born one day in one moment that very first year that we were meeting at La Petite Child Care Center and I was doing a teaching on worship and, and spending time really involved in worship with the Lord during the week and a lady came up to me afterwards, she had two kids, single mother, she said, I don't have any money to buy worship tapes. You know, there's tapes in those days, there's no CDs even then. There's tapes, she goes, I don't have any money to buy tape, to, 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 to buy any worship music and the Holy Spirit said, give her some money. I'm like, are you kidding, we don't have any. How do you give money you don't have? You know, I'm like teaching elementary school at Royden Elementary School, uh, and I'm doing this church, and, and we're barely paying our bills, but clearly the Lord told me to help the lady. You know, give her some money so she could buy worship music. So I walked over. We had a box people put money in, like in the back here, and I walked over, and I said to the guy who was in charge of that, I said, would you give me $100 to give this lady? So he gave me $100. I said, here, go buy some, some cassette tapes and listen to worship in your car. And, and when she walked away, she didn't know it, but the Lord used that moment to change my life. Because see, I had to make a decision if I was gonna be a giver or a taker. I had to decide if I was gonna help people who were hurting or not. And though it was a very small moment in time, it changed my destiny. Because I decided no matter what I had or didn't have, I was gonna help other people. I was gonna do that no matter what. And because out of that, friends, God has completely blessed us because his word promises that he would. That's how we ended up as a caring church, caring for the poor. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. But then we ended up sending people all over, overseas all the time, and we're gonna talk about that. And then we, we, we relationships, we had relationships. Why? Because there was only 50 of us. Hello? It was like a big, small group. We just hung together all the time, we ate together all the time, we, we did life together. It was just us, we was like 50 of us, and we just hung together, and out of that became this. It wasn't always like this, friends, it was just a handful of people really committed to the king and the kingdom, and God did the work. So let me walk you through these quickly and show you kind of what God did. So if you got your Bible, your iPad, your phone, look at Ephesians 4.12. Let's talk about healing, but just for a moment. It says he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So, so, so let me unpack this. It says he gave some, these are people that have giftings, 
callings to help build the church. Some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. But he did it for a purpose. What was the purpose? To equip, to equip the people. saints. They're called saints. Y'all are saints. If you're a Jesus follower, you are a what? Saint. Don't look like a saint to me. And often, I don't look like a saint to you. But the Bible calls us what? He calls us saints. It's an amazing picture. So the Bible actually says this, that God gave people, put them into our lives, pastors, teachers, prophets, evangelists, for the equipping of the saints for a purpose, for the work of service. So, so, so it goes like this. I know what you really think. You think that I get paid to do the work and you come and enjoy the work. <laughs> no, that isn't what, what is supposed to happen. That is actually what happens about 80% of the churches in America, but it's not what is supposed to happen. It's not like you pay somebody to do the work. You're supposed to equip the people to do the work, which means everybody in the house is a minister. Everybody has a calling to care for other people. Everybody has a destiny. It's like, like I have a destiny, but you don't. It's like, everybody is. So we, we used to say, every member is a minister, you know, because everybody's supposed to do this. Now, let me explain how healing is part of this. The word equipping is a very interesting word in the Greek language, it's kardatizo. And kardatizo includes these kinds of thoughts. To put in order, to regulate, to work, to complete something, to restore something or mend something back. So if you go to Matthew chapter four, verse 21, there's a story about James and John being in a boat with Zebedee, their father, and Jesus is coming to talk to them, and it says they were in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. They were doing what? Cardatizoing their nets. They were putting their nets back together because they were torn. So the picture of equipping the saints for the work of the service, the word cardatizo is literally a medical term that means if you had a broken arm, you put a cast on it, you would be doing what? Cardatizo. It would be cardatizoing it. It would be getting healed, put back together. So, 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 so hold it. That means there's a picture of people when they come to Jesus that they need help to be put back what? Together, together to be made whole to be put back together. So here's a question I always ask people. Do you ever watch folks that come to Jesus and they, they just like flood their lives with spiritual things, with, with like religious stuff? Like so they got bumper stickers on their cars, they're listening to worship music all the time, they're watching Christian TV, they're listening to every single person preach on the radio that they can hear. And Anybody know people like this? And they never change. No, I know some people like this. They flood their lives with stuff, but they never change. They never change. And you should ask yourself a question. Listen, this is supposed to be about transformation. You're supposed to be changed from the inside out. So if you flood your life with information, but you don't see any transformation, you should be asking yourself what? What is wrong? There's something wrong with the picture. What's wrong with the picture? It is this. They need their nets mended, their heart put back together. Jesus put it this way, he said, I will pour in you rivers of living water that will flow in you and flow out of you. So literally, you should be capturing the living water the Holy Spirit's pouring in you, and it should flow back out of you to bless other people. Now, if that's not happening, that's because you have a crack in your pot. And God is pouring living water in you, but it's just running right out the bottom. So I always like to tell people, really, you are a crackpot, okay? So you, you, you need to get healing, you need carnitizo. So discipling for us at Water of Life starts with healing a lot of times. We try to get people into healing classes so they can mend up the holes in their soul so that whenever God starts to build them, they can actually, what, grow, they can grow. So that's the picture. I realized, a long time ago I realized this, that people who open up and allow God to work are the people who grew. People who stay closed and live constantly guarded don't grow nearly as deep or as wide as the people who throw open the doors of their lives. Now, here's the truth. You hate that. Some of you are sitting there, I'm not ever doing that. I don't want anybody to know what, what's going on in here. That's why you don't grow. No, you gotta figure that. That's why I always say to you, get in a small group, get in a small group, get in a small group. When you get in a small group and you can trust people and tell them the truth that you're really struggling with issues in your life, then you start to open up, the Holy Spirit can move in and you can grow. 
you can get healing and you can grow. But, 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 but listen, if you are by nature afraid, and we all are, you, you, it, how many of you know it gets hard sometimes? It takes pain, tragedy, loss, because you're afraid. And until your heart breaks, you're not desperate enough to open up. But when God allows your heart to break and you start to open up, then everything changes. I mean, there's a story we're gonna tell you in, at length in the next few weeks, but about a lady who our church actually started with healing ministry because she came forward one night at the end of a Bible study, then she knelt on the floor and she said, you know, I've gotta have exploratory surgery next week because my stomach aches all the time. And before the night was done, our whole lives had been blown up because her husband came up in front of all of us and confessed that he had had an affair. And then the lady he had an affair with walked up from the other side of the Bible study and knelt down and said it was with me front of everybody. Nobody knew any of this. Okay, so yeah, that was a bad night. But I'm not gonna tell you any more about that story because I'll tell you what, the lady who's knelt down, she is gonna tell you that story in a few weeks, personally. So you're gonna get to hear her side of that story and actually how God entered in when she opened up and brought supernatural healing. It's an amazing story. So let, let's talk about this. Healing in a biblical way, friends, is life-giving. The next week, seven more couples that were in that Bible study came to me and said, we are having an affair or have had an affair and we want healing. And all of them stayed married. They actually became the leaders here at Water of Life. Okay, but that's, you know, some of you are like, okay, I'm leaving. No, 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 listen, you need to think like this. That is exactly what happened with David, with King David. It says that he gathered all the outcasts, all the misfits came to David and God turned them into an army. That's what God tries to do. He tries to take people that are, really want to get healed and transform them into healing people. And so that, that, that's actually what happened here. That's the biblical way. Let's talk about the second thing, caring. Caring is such a huge value here. My life changed one day when I was down at the Anaheim Vineyard and we were trying to learn how to do worship because remember we were using cassette tapes? Hello? Is that tapes? And so Eddie Espinoza, who at that time was one of the preeminent worship leaders in America, was willing to disciple our people and help us try to figure out how to do worship in our church. So we were meeting with Eddie on a Sunday night, and I didn't know it, but we were in the pastor's office. His name was John Wimber. We were in his office, and Eddie was doing this whole thing of teaching us about worship, and John Wimber walked in the door. But he didn't see us. He started to come in the door, and his secretary called to him, and he turned around, and he said, said to her, how big was the offering we took this morning? And she said it was over $100,000. And this was 1990, okay? Over $100,000. And he said, give it away to all those five agencies that I told you we're gonna support those people to help the poor. Give it away, all of it away to those people. Just like that, 100 grand. I was like, are you kidding? I have a cocoa can. <laughs> I mean, a hundred, and he just like this, he just gave it away, Pew, just gave it away. You know, I had the opportunity once to watch Billy Graham do that. When I, I, I saw him, I was in the room with Billy Graham and several pastors, and, and he was presented a million dollar check, never flinched at all. He just said, listen, I wanna give this to the poor, and he, and he said, so he handed the check off to this guy, just said, here, I want you to give this away to these people and bless them. It was a million dollars. But you know what you figure out? It isn't a dollar or a million dollars, it's a heart. It's about generosity and learning to be a giver and not a taker. And that night in John Wimber's office, when I saw him do that, I was so taken by that. I said this, Lord, I'm really praying for this church to fail. But if it doesn't, I pray that we could help people like that someday. I wanna do that. And that is why we have a caring ministry, friends. That's why we have 17 houses today with 44 homeless people living in them. It's why we're building a brand new campus that is like halfway done. It's an amazing, amazing thing. Uh, all of that started in the back of our pickup trucks. We used to load up food. Sunday night, Tuesday night after Bible study, we load up food and we just go down to the fields. And there was a tent encampment in those days in Ontario. We'd just go down to the fields and we'd feed people and talk to them about Jesus. I want you to watch this video of a guy sharing that story with you really quick. I'm Bobby Malins. I come from the early years of the church when we used to take 
our Ford pickups loaded with food and clothes and head down to the streets and empty dirt fields in Ontario at 4th Street and feed the people there. And we would have a Friday night Bible study. I'd go meet these guys in a field and start providing clothes. We started seeing things that they needed. It was during this time, maybe six, eight months later, that we were invited by a couple uh, to a Water of Life Bible study that was happening at Pastor Dan and Gail's house. Uh, we went, we fell in love with the people, we fell in love with Pastor Danny. Just saw something in the church, a heart for people that we really loved. At this time, I shared with Pastor Dan uh, what was going on down in Ontario and that I was starting to get more and more people and, and really asking for advice on what to do. And he immediately uh, jumped on board, asked to come down and, and meet these guys and see what was going on and introduced Pastor Dan to Larry. And this is where I learned something huge in my life in a ministry that was life-changing for me uh, from Pastor Dan was immediately, he went right after the heart. I was always leaving there with a notepad of what they needed outwardly, outwardly with what I could see. Uh, clothes, shoes, more food, tents, pup tents, where Pastor Dan right away went in and asked Larry, what's your story? How did you end up here? Uh, tell me about yourself. And I'll never forget that day because Larry had shared how tragic his life had been. His eight-year-old daughter had died. After that, his wife couldn't handle it. She committed suicide. And it turned Larry's normal world upside down. And I learned as a 30-some-year-old man at that time that, wow, there's, there's a lot more to this. And there's some really broken people I'm looking at these people at this point as kind of they made their bed or this was their choice to be out here. At that point, I kind of thought I had all the answers. I was at Bible college. I thought I knew it all. And for me, this was a huge growing period in my life and connecting with the human heart and, and coming to Water of Life and seeing the heart of the people and the values of the people of really getting involved with people and involved with their lives, uh, not just giving them a couple scriptures and sending them on their way, but really engaging in their lives uh, was a, a powerful life-changing experience for me, for the hearts of, of Water of Life and the values that it's always had. Just really excited to see Water of Life continue to care, continue to reach out to the homeless, to the helpless, to the people that are really in need, uh, back to where it started, back where I came almost 34 years ago. And to see it happening through CityLink and see it happening through the people here is very exciting. So for those of you who don't know what we do, just briefly, I'll put up a slide here and show you some of the statistics. Oh, there's a picture. That's, that is our new CityLink building. And so um, it is happening. And we are gonna kick it off, Lord willing, in August. We'll move in there. And so that's an amazing thing. That was pictures were taken last week when I was down there. Um, but here's some statistics for you. Like these are some of the things that happened last year at CityLink. We gave over 17,000 hours to people, served uh, you know, 114,000 boxes of food to people. And there's all kinds of statistics. You can see them out in the foyer, out in the concourse area before you leave. You wanna take a look at them. There's a display out there that you can get an understanding of what we do at CityLink is amazing. It's amazing, amazing. But, but watch this. Here was the promise of God. And we just grabbed a hold of that years ago. And how many of you know if you hold on to the promise of God, he always keeps his word. De Deuteronomy 15.10 says this, give freely without begrudging it, and the Lord your God will bless you in everything that you do. Amen. Give freely without begrudging it, and the Lord your God will bless you in everything that you do. See, those in need and broken and hurting, they have a special place in the heart of your father. God is compassion. I say that to you all the time. He's loving, he's crazy about people. And, and, and really the truth is this, is that I didn't understand how important the poor were to God until I got involved with them. And I, and I realized that Jesus, when Jesus said, listen, the poor will always be with you. There's a reason, because you need them. Yes. And I need them. Yes. When I'm with people that are really broken and hurting and poor, and I hear their stories, like they got stories, and you hear their story like Larry, and you realize, oh my gosh, his daughter died, his wife took her life. 
this poor guy's shattered. And, and his only hope is Jesus. Yes. And, and that's what we do, friends. So today we have 17 houses with 44 people in them. And Lord willing, in August, we're going to open up 20 more trailers and put another 40 or 50 people in them. And we're starting to work on the plans right now for a, 30, a building with 30 apartments in it that we're believing in God that we're going to break ground on in the next year and build an apartment building to start housing people. There's so many things happening, but none of them can happen without you. This isn't like my idea. This is like God's idea for us. That's why caring is so important for us. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 says this. God told Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so you shall be a blessing, and in all in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. So what does it mean? It means this. God blessed you so you would be a what? A blessing. Not just so you'd be blessed. I mean, God, you're going to get blessed in this journey. But you're blessed so you can become a blessing to other people. So let's talk about this. And we're going to get down here and wrap this up. Let's talk about equipping. It goes back to that same verse we already talked about in Ephesians 4.12. He gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints. So pastors and teachers are called to equip people to live for God. And those people are called to do the work of service. So today we have a team of 200 people working with our homeless people. We have 28 staff people down there working with people. We have all kinds of people engaged here. I gave you the statistics last week of how many of you came and served over 600 in children's ministry. Friends, that is the work of service. This can't happen without you. If you don't engage and serve, nothing changes. People's lives are transformed by you. So, so what does that mean? At Water of Life, equipping means more than just going to Bible study. Now, I know a lot of you love the word and you want to go to Wednesday night Bible study and you want to study the Bible. That's awesome. But it's supposed to be more than that. It's supposed to be exposed to the truth, the Bible, understanding the word of God, and then exposed to touching people and actually making a difference with what God has given you. So for us, I, I, I was trying to figure out, God, how do we do this? And you've got to forgive me for, for this, but I'm a coach. So I'm trying to figure out what the win is. Like, is the win if we open up the doors and 100 people show up for an event? Or 1,000? Or 10,000? Because Jesus never said that was a win. He didn't say gather lots and lots of people. He never said that. He said, make what? Disciples. Go and make disciples, Jesus followers. Go and make people that will follow after me. Uh, friends, the win for us at Water of Life is a transformed life demonstrated by being given to God and given to people. A transformed life. That means more than just receiving information, like going to a Bible study. It has to do with transformation. Information is the beginning of transformation, but transformation only happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit of God touching you and changing you from the inside what? out. That's how transformation takes place. So the reality for us, it, equipping includes both teaching and training, studying and doing to expose people to the truth and expose people to a course of action so that you can make a difference in other people's lives. You're supposed to engage with what God gives you. He doesn't equip you for nothing. He equips you for destiny. So he gives you the tools to change the world, but you have to engage. So, so, so what does that mean? It means school of ministry. It means this, the grow catalog. So you got these little flyers, I think, in your, in, in your handouts today. Is that right? Yes. Just yes. the people in the front row here? Yes. Anybody else out there? Get this. Okay, just checking. Okay, so you got this. It's got a QR code on the back. You can, like... Snap the QR code and you will get the catalog. And there's probably, there may be a few of these catalogs left out in the concourse area. You can pick one of these up on the way out. Why? Because you need to take classes to grow. Now let me explain something to you. Nobody grows from a class or a program. That never happens. People grow when they encounter other people that are touched by God and help them to grow. Amen. That's how God designed this. He, he could have done this all without us, but he didn't. He decided to engage people to engage other people. So he touches me so I can do what? Touch you. And he touches you so you can touch other people. But you can't do that unless you what? Grow. Unless you grow. Healthy things grow, friends. You gotta figure that out. Healthy things grow. You're supposed to grow. This isn't about flatlining and just doing what you've always done. It's about growing. So part of equipping people is to grow, 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 grow. So let's talk about this. Our fourth value is relationships. And I already explained that to you. We were small. We needed each other. But friends, everybody in the house needs other people. 
Let me read a verse to you, very important. 1 John 4, 8. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. The one who does not love doesn't know God, for God is love. So let me ask you a question. Is it possible for you to love outside a relationship with other people? It's impossible. The only way you love is when you're in relationship with other people. All different levels, but you gotta be in relationship with other people. And some of you are like, no, pastor, I love God, it's just I can't stand the people. <laughs> no, come on, I mean, some of y'all online, that's you, you're at home because of that, I'm playing with you, but no, 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 real, real. they don't wanna be around you, so don't laugh too much, because they're staying home because of you, so no, I'm joking. I'm playing with you, listen. Pastor, I hear this. Pastor, I get hurt at church. I've been hurt. I, I get that totally. All joking aside, I totally get that. But you've been hurt at home, yes. at school, yes. at work, yes. and at church. Yes. Because there's humans there. Right. And we hurt each other. Yes. That's just, now, do we like, no, 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 no. That's why the Bible's just full of ways to get through that. L -l Let me, there's just, you gotta figure this out. The relationships are tough. They're hard, they're hard, they're hard. What does that mean you shouldn't be in them? No, you got to do the hard work of getting along with people, the Bible says. And friends, how many of you know it's hard work? It's impossible to love people outside of relationship. Listen to the early church. This is where it all began. Acts chapter two, verse 42. All the believers, oh, oh, before I read anymore, I want you to help me with the first word. What was it? Say, say it loud up in the back, all, all the believers, not some of the believers, the believers who really wanted to, it says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, and to prayer. All, all, all of the people, why? why? Because they understood this, programs don't transform people, people do. You gotta be with other people. To be healthy and growing, you must be in relationship with other people at work, at school, at home, at community, at church, wherever you are. James 3.18 in the message paraphrase says this perfect. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy all of its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other. That's how it is. But friends, the hard work is when you grow in conflict with people, when you struggle through it and you don't just give up and you don't just get mad and you don't just throw it down and you don't just walk away and you forgive a person who's wounded you and they forgive you when you wounded them. That's how this is supposed to go. It's, how many of you know it's hard work to get along with other people? It says this, only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. So finally, let's close up with this. Our fifth value is sending. Matthew 28, 19 says, go and make disciples. Acts 1, 4, Jesus talking, you should be my witnesses to the remotest parts of the earth. Of the earth. So, so, so we say at Water of Life, neighborhoods and nations. You're supposed to reach neighborhoods and what? Nations. So that means at home and abroad, wherever you go, mission is crucial to building people. Not missions as being a missionary, mission as in having a purpose. You're supposed, friends, everybody's supposed to have a purpose. Now, church growth experts say this, 80% of the churches in America, they say, are unhealthy. They fight all the time with each other over stuff like what? Like the lighting, the carpet, the color of the carpet. You know, churches split over the color of the carpet. Now, fortunately for Water of Life, that's never happened to us uh, because we don't have carpet. So, you know, we just did away with carpet so you wouldn't fight over it. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. No, 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 listen. The only reason people fight over stuff like that is because they don't care about the people that are going to hell. If you have a mission to change the world and touch people for Jesus, you don't have time to fight over stuff because you give yourself to the things of God. You give yourself to the purposes that God called you for. You need, listen, you need other people and they need you. Jesus didn't say this, hey, this is a really cool idea. Uh, if you get time, would you please go? He didn't say that. It's a command. In the original language, it's called an imperative mood. It means I'm not asking you, I'm what? I'm telling you, you gotta do this. Go and make disciples. Go and I'll go with you. Go and I'll show up. Some of you are like, I don't ever grow, Pastor. You, because you never go. 
You don't grow if you don't go, friends. You just stay in your little comfort zone. You gotta understand this, like 1 Peter 4, he, Peter's talking about, he says, listen, you have to love people fervently. And the word is ectino. Ectino, the word fervently. It means ek is out, tino is stretch. It means stretch out. If you're gonna go, you're gonna stretch out. Friends, when we can bring people up here and they're going to Cuba, they're going to, like we got a team in Kenya right now, they're like stretching out. Some of you are like, I ain't stretching out. No, 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 just go to Mexico with us to an orphanage. Go down to CityLink and serve somebody that's poor. Get out of your comfort zone if you want to grow. That's the journey. So, 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 we're done. So, we're done, but watch. This is really important, you get this. It's not an option, it's a destiny. Going is a destiny. Now, if you don't believe that, I want you to watch this little video here right now. This is the first outreach we ever took here. When there was just, I was gonna go back to Malaysia and a bunch of guys in the Bible study said, I wanna go with you. So here's your homework test for this video. Find my son and daughter. Because they're really small people. And some of you tell me this, oh my gosh, I could have never do that. My kids would be, listen, these, this was Borneo. These are Ebon tribal people. Historically, they were headhunters. We would go into their villages and there would be human skulls hanging from the ceiling of their huts. Okay? Now, I want you to watch this and I want you to think about this. Your children's destiny is this, it's tied to you going and touching other people. It's not tied to Sunday school. It's tied to you. Watch the video and we'll be done. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of the uh, You go back to the time when uh, Pastor Danny had just finished doing his DTS in Malaysia. He came home and we had a Bible study and he said, I feel like I'm supposed to go back. And I felt uh, that I was supposed to go back. I was supposed to go there too. And uh, the two of us went with a couple other people. And that really was the beginnings of a long-term relationship with churches and people in Malaysia. And that was sort of the foundations of the missions department of Water of Life today. Water of Life has been my home. I was on the first trip that went over to Malaysia. The mission trips have always been a heart. You hear Pastor Dan, if you've attended here for any length of time or, or talked to him, you know that, that outreach is numero uno for him. Over the years, we just kept getting bigger and bigger and going to more and more places, and our reach has expanded. And that's because that is really the heart of God, is to touch people and touch nations, and that is what we're about at Water of Life. Wow. Stand with me, would you? The stories, if you like the stories, they're in this little book. It came out of my journal. It's our story of faith, that's what you see up on the back. And we'll be talking about this the next five or six weeks and hopefully you'll figure out that God has a destiny and a purpose for you set that you can engage in that would transform your life and other people around you. So Father, we wanna come and just say thank you for the ride. It's been amazing 35 years. You have done beyond what we could have ever asked or thought. And so I just thank you for that, Lord, but do pray that there's more that you would do more and bigger and better than you've ever done before here, that you would engage people at a level that would shock them, and they would look back a year or two or five from now and say, look at God, what he did in my life, in my children's lives, in our family, that you alone, Lord, have what we need. So I pray for us, we would chase hard after you, and you, Holy Spirit, would do the work in us that we can't do. In the name of Jesus, everybody said amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you if you need prayer. Make your way to the front. There'll be a team of people up here to pray for you. God bless.